With the ongoing war in Ukraine, there has been a monumental pile of information coming out daily about what has been going on. In light of this overwhelming amount of raw information, several groups attempt to sift through this information and interpret it. These groups are called Open Source Intelligences, abbreviated to OSINTs. As the name denotes, these are organizations that specialize in sorting through and interpreting information, which is provided to the wider public. Their role in the recent conflict has been to calculate and roughly predict the casualty figures of both the Russian and Ukrainian forces. This, on the face of it, is not a bad cause, as it can help provide for the wider public a rough idea of the overall performance of the different forces involved, which can be utilized to determine what way the conflict is currently hitting. However, there is a critical flaw in the system. OSINTs, notably Oryx, have shown noteworthy flaws in their overall intelligence gathering and interpretation of this information. The flaw, in particular, is the reliance, or over-reliance, on visually confirmed kills, in order to gauge the overall effectiveness of either side in the conflict combined with a seeming bias against the Russians and for the Ukrainians when interpreting the information. This is best exemplified in the prediction of Russian vehicle losses. Recently, they have catalogued over 10,000 vehicle losses for the Russian forces, including 2,437 tanks as of October 2023. To those who aren't well-versed in what is going on, or those with a strong bias against the Russians, the number might be taken at face value without pause for reconsideration. However, to those who lean towards the Russian side, or those who have witnessed the current state of the conflict, this figure would need to be taken with a grain of salt. If this figure were true, we should see a far more significant decline in the performance of the Russians in the conflict, which simply has not made itself manifest. Rather, what has been seen is the development of a stalemate, with a little sign of the Russians showing any significant military decline. This is affirmed with the general failure of the Ukrainian counteroffensive and the Russians renewing their offensives on the salient around Avdivka. This leads us to two questions. What is wrong with the information Oryx is presenting? Is there some flaw in the methods they are using? Why is it that people believe this information, even though it suffers from critical flaws? To answer both of these questions, we need to turn to a previous conflict where intelligence agencies suffered from eerily similar flaws as we've seen with Oryx and other open-source intelligences. We must look back to the spring of 1862, during the American Civil War, and see the exploits of one of the most infamous military intelligence personnel in the history of the United States, Alan Pinkerton. For those who are unaware, Alan Pinkerton had made his name as detective prior to the American Civil War, enough so that he had formed his own company, the Pinkerton Detective Agency, in Chicago, Illinois. However, when the war broke out, he was recruited by the Union to act as the head of intelligence for the Army of the Potomac, placing him within the inner circle of General George B. McClellan. His job was to gather as much information as possible about the enemy, including troop numbers, casualties, defensive positions, the movement of these units, and so on, and then interpret that information to present to McClellan. Based on this information, McClellan would draw up his tactical plans to best achieve victory on the battlefield. This system, when working properly, should be able to figure out close approximations of all of these things and thereby enable the army to achieve significant victories. However, beginning in March of 1862, Pinkerton's time as the head of the army's intelligence wing would prove to be an unmitigated disaster. Prior to the advance of the Army of the Potomac from their base of operations near Fort Monroe, Pinkerton's information collection would truly begin, with a gleaning over of scarce reports of Magruder's advanced works facing Fort Monroe, specifically from three accounts. 
However, they neglected to mention the defensive works on the opposing bank of the Warwick River, which ran from the James towards Yorktown. For troop figures, McClellan had turned to Fort Monroe's commander, John E. Wool, who telegraphed Washington, stating that Magruder had from 15,000 to 18,000 men, extending from the James River to Yorktown. And these numbers were incredibly accurate due, in no small part, to Wool's use of a double deserter who relayed the information back to Wool. They overestimated Magruder's numbers by 1,400 men, remarkably accurate in its own right. However, this was due more to Wool's actions than to Pinkerton's intelligence gathering. As the campaign progressed and moved away from Fort Monroe, these estimates would inflate drastically. By early April 1862, McClellan had advanced up the peninsula towards Yorktown and had laid siege to it. Though he greatly outnumbered the enemy forces, Pinkerton's agents produced findings that stated otherwise. Upon interrogation of three men from the 14th Alabama, they claimed that Magruder had 40,000 men and was to be reinforced by Joe Johnston, swelling their numbers up to 100,000 men. In truth, Joe Johnston had brought up only 8,000 reinforcements to assist in the defense of Yorktown, which would increase it only to 34,400 men. The siege of Yorktown would last approximately a month, with McClellan believing he was facing a far superior force than his own. This belief was continually fed into by Pinkerton's reports. In a report made on May 2, 1862, Pinkerton had interrogated a contraband, a slave who had fled towards Union lines, claiming that the Confederates were willing to make a final stand and had 75,000 troops at their disposal. On May 3rd, Pinkerton reported to McClellan that the enemy forces were between 100,000 to 120,000 men, a statement he claimed was merely a medium estimate, which was likely under rather than over the mark of the real strength of the rebel forces at Yorktown. In truth, the Confederates had abandoned their positions, which Heinzelman, taking a flight up in the Union observation balloon Intrepid, had discovered on May 4, 1862. However, in spite of having access to observation balloons, the estimates of the strength of the Confederate forces would only continue to balloon to ever higher numbers. In the following weeks after the siege of Yorktown, Pinkerton's agents would interrogate the locals of Yorktown and Williamsburg to figure out the total number of troops the Confederacy had. And many of them were civilians, none of whom could be considered authoritative. The predicted number of men for the Army of Northern Virginia would swell to over 150,000 men, with these people claiming they had between 400 to 500 artillery pieces. This ever-increasingly faulty intelligence would later be exploited by Robert E. Lee, shortly after taking command of the Army of Northern Virginia. By June 1862, many of Alan Pinkerton's agents in the city of Richmond had been captured and one, Timothy Webster, had been hanged, meaning that most of the information coming from the capital of the Confederacy, and by extension the Confederate lines, came from deserters of various degrees. These men often fed into these wild speculations, such as the case of a Frenchman and a deserter from the 8th Georgia, who claimed that Lee was reinforcing Jackson in the valley with over 15,000 men. In truth, Lee had only sent 8,000 men to reinforce Jackson. It was this combination that led to a further increase in the overall estimation of the strength of the Confederate forces. In a report filed on June 15, 1862, Pinkerton stated, It is variously estimated that the rebel army at Richmond and vicinity numbers from 150,000 to 200,000 men. He later settled with a general estimate of 180,000 men. In truth, the real strength of the Army of Northern Virginia was closer to 90,000 men. In fact, a northern newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, had made a prediction of 100,000 men, with roughly 20 to 30,000 of them being made up of raw and undisciplined soldiers. In his final report on troop figures, 
Alan Pinkerton would double down on the 180000 estimate and continue to insist that it was probably short of the real strength of their army. This final prediction came on June 24th, 1862, two days before Lee would launch his counteroffensive on June 26th, 1862. And this offensive would drive the Army of the Potomac from their advanced positions around Richmond and completely reverse the fortunes of the Confederacy, going from being besieged to being the besiegers. This unmitigated disaster in Army intelligence is one that has gone down in the history books as one of the worst blunders in intelligence gathering in U.S. military history and military history as a whole. This leads us back to the two questions I posited earlier in this video. First, we need to understand what exactly is wrong with the information Oryx is presenting and whether their methods are partially to blame. This problem is made self-evident through the system they use, using singular photographs or videos to determine vehicle losses. This system, known as visually confirmed losses, has a significant flaw that only takes a casual look at the photos coming out of the theater to see. Many of the images presented are blurry, making it difficult to identify what happened to the vehicle, who it belongs to, and whether it was taken in Ukraine during the ongoing conflict. The first contention of note is determining who the vehicle belongs to. This particular point is relevant as both sides use Soviet-era equipment in significant quantities meaning that identifying which nation the vehicle belongs to is more difficult. This makes misidentifying Ukrainian losses as Russian losses, or vice versa, a common problem. The second contention is determining what happened to the vehicle. Take this image as an example. The vehicle, which is a Russian T-80, appears to be destroyed. But how was it destroyed? Well. It's hard to tell for certain, as this is the only angle I've seen of the vehicle. It could have been taken out by another tank, or by an ATGM. But it is just as likely the engine could have caught fire, and the thing burned up in the flames. However, due to the blurry nature of the photograph, and the lack of any other angles of the vehicle, I can't tell you for certain what happened here. The third... And final contention is one that has been committed quite often in online spheres, which is claiming losses from other conflicts or from periods prior to the 2022 Russian intervention in the conflict as new losses. Many photographs, such as the one example from 2014, have been listed as Russian losses in this current conflict, even though the vehicle was taken out back in 2014. This continues on to this day with people, such as Laserpig, sharing photos of Russian tanks that weren't even Russian tanks, and photographs that were taken as far back as 2015. These problems continually confront the methodology used by Oryx in determining vehicle losses. Yet there are still more issues. These combat losses often presume they are permanent losses rather than temporary losses. For instance, a tank that has its tracks blown off, but suffers little to no damage, could be classified as a combat loss or casualty, even though the repair for it may take less than a day, thus rendering it a short-term loss. It's the lack of any distinction that makes Oryx's figures even less trustworthy. This inevitably means that Oryx's numbers, no matter if their guesses are 100% correct, will not be 100% accurate. This doesn't even posit the idea of the Russians potentially exploiting this system to feed it false information to deceive Western analysts or fascinated laymen into believing that they are far weaker than they truly are. However, for the sake of this video, we won't presume this is happening, though it would not surprise me if it was happening at all. All of these factors, when taken into account, means that the figures presented by Oryx are likely overstated by a significant amount.
I'd even go as far to say that Oryx's figures are overstated by 100% of the true total of Russian vehicle losses. Instead of it being over 10,000 vehicle losses, it is likely closer to 5,000 vehicles. Instead of it being 2,437 Russian tank losses, the actual figure is probably closer to 1,000 to 1,300 tank losses. Still considerable, but not absurdly high. Certainly not high enough to show any real diminishing of the Russians' military capabilities. But this leads us into the second question. Why do people believe this critically flawed information? There are two potential reasons why people would believe these figures, or pretend to believe these figures. First, they could be disillusioned with the war itself. To refer back to the Peninsula Campaign, Stephen Sears makes it clear that George B. McClellan had already overestimated his enemy's strength, which Alan Pinkerton, whether deliberately or accidentally, reinforced throughout the Peninsula Campaign. Sears portrayed McClellan as having been disillusioned with the reality of the situation, always believing he was facing a far larger force than he truly was. In the case of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, it's likely that many of the Ukrainian fans have disillusioned themselves into the idea of the supremacy of Ukraine over the evil Russians. They want to believe the Ukrainians are winning the war and are curb-stomping the Russians, so they choose to believe in Oryx's figures in spite of both views contradicting the reality of the current situation. A long, attritional trench warfare that has proven to be more painful for the Ukrainians than the Russians. The second possibility is that supporting these false figures is a means to an end. What I'm referring to is the idea of promoting Ukraine as being far more capable than it actually is in order to promote countries to continue to funnel aid to Ukraine in the form of weaponry, aircraft, and tanks. However, this is likely far less commonplace as the former explanation as people tend to be more inclined to double down on a cause rather than strategically use false reports to gain more of what they want. Regardless of the reason, whether that be out of sheer emotional response or Machiavellian maneuvering, Oryx is often taken at face value, even though it is patently obvious that the methods they have used are incredibly flawed. In conclusion, it is this delusional belief in the questionable reports of an open-source intelligence that has led me to develop the term the Alan Pinkerton Effect to describe this phenomenon. Open-source intelligences, just as with any intelligence-gathering system, needs to have a rigorous system to vet and filter out bad information in order to come up with more reliable information. The overwhelming amount of raw, undigested data flowing into these OSINTs has led to them becoming increasingly untrustworthy, just as Alan Pinkerton's wildly overinflated estimations of Confederate troop numbers made him less trustworthy and the proverbial butt of the joke of the Peninsula Campaign. And most important of all, it is important for those receiving this information to think critically of the information presented to them to question it earnestly and process it before accepting such information. Taking any information at face value is a dangerous proposition. Always think critically about what is being presented before believing what you read. Be responsible, lest you end up from being the besieger to being the besieged.